Heads up, this podcast contains some swearing. Previously on Lost in Williamsburg. Police! Ah! What in the name of Jesus is that thing on the floor? Hello? Is anyone with us tonight? Any lost souls who need to talk? What's going on with Megan's voice? Where am I, Caleb? I can't see! You know, she says she's trying to have a seance to talk with Aaron. You're taking this too seriously. So, what are you doing here tonight, Professor? Did I ever tell you about that time back in 1760 when Thomas Jefferson and I spent all Hallow's Eve soaping up the windows of the Wren building? Good evening. This is your host, Caroline Corney. I don't normally intrude at the beginning of an episode, but seeing as we are nearing the end of our story and things are getting rather convoluted, I thought I might chime in now and then to help our listeners untangle the many twisting threads of our story. I suppose I should have been keeping a tighter rein on things all along, but I've been preoccupied. I do have a life, you know. So, without further ado, let us resume our tale of the tiny tourist town of Williamsburg, Virginia, whose reconstructed houses and manicured gardens hide far more mysteries than could ever be told in our little podcast. It's been a long Halloween night in Williamsburg, filled with music and memories, shadows and specters, love and betrayal. Here at the Williamsburg Cemetery, strolling amongst the obelisks and gravestones, the ghost of Professor Jabriath one-time mentor of the young Thomas Jefferson, is attempting to soothe the nerves of Julie Dunhill. If you remember, Julie, or rather her disembodied essence, has been floating free of her comatose body since the early 80s. But tonight, that essence has made its way into the old historic graveyard in order to mourn at the resting place of Julie's recently deceased sister and serial killer, Valerie Dunhill. Well, Julie, as you might suspect, Halloween in 1760 was different than it is now. Leaves fell from the trees several weeks earlier, and snow came sooner. And as I recall, on that distant October night, the remnants of the fall's first flurry frosted the grounds of the William & Mary campus. It wasn't a pretty sight, though. The students and livestock had already turned into filthy mush. It was past midnight when Thomas Jefferson arrived at the back of my tiny office near the Wren building. He seemed a bit nervous. Earlier in the day, I had received a scolding letter from Professor William Small, complaining about Thomas's poor performance on a recent exam, and not so subtly implying the college's outdated teaching methods played no small part. Small, a recent emigre from Scotland, was new to the faculty. He had no standing to make such impertinent remarks, so I had arranged for Thomas to meet me on that dark, holy night to craft a humorous, if scathing, reply. Professor, are you sure this is a good idea, lurking around the Wren building like criminals? What if we get caught? Or freeze to death. Come on, Thomas, it's all Hallow's Eve, for goodness sake. We're allowed to partake in a few mischievous revelries. Yes, but I'm worried that Professor Small might not appreciate our revelries as much as you do. Thomas, you've been at William Mary how long now? Six months? Seven. Well, granted, that's not very long, but I think you've earned the right to engage in a bit of harmless fun at the expense of our Scottish interloper. You do? Yes. That failing grade that he gave you on your natural philosophy exam was entirely uncalled for especially considering all the extra help I gave you in preparation. But that's... I suspect he knew of my role. That's why he was so harsh. Professor... pompous bastard. His self-regard is far too high. He deserves a comeuppance. Really, Professor, what is one bad grade in the grand scheme of things? Hmm. He did have some insightful comments. Misguided might be a more accurate term. Anyway, our retribution is no more than a devilish prank. No real harm done. (sighs) So what's the plan? Well, once the perimeter is secured, we'll make our way, stealthily, into the Wren Courtyard. Ah, we shall be as fleet as foxes. Yes, and then once we're within the courtyard walls, positioned below the windows, you, my boy, shall take this bar of soap, alight my shoulders, and havoc will reign. Havoc? Thomas, I want you to give those windows a hearty what for. Uh, if you insist. Smudges, squiggles, whatever you want. But remember, I've planned an especially clever message for the window over Small's desk, so we'll save that one for last. All right, then. Shall we get on with it? Not just yet. I have arranged for a rather clever compatriot to join us momentarily. He'll be our eyes and ears in this merry endeavor. I explained to Thomas that a new student would be joining our ranks. The unfortunate lad had been studying up at Harvard, but due to some misunderstandings with the faculty, his father decided to bring him home to pursue his studies here. I believe the official accusations were insouciance, lassitude, and a bit of skullduggery. Professor. Ah, Here he is now. Over here. Good Hallow's Eve, Professor. Welcome, welcome. Thomas, I'd like you to meet Richard Holcomb of Riverview Plantation. Hello. And Richard, this is Thomas Jefferson of... Yes, of Shadwell, one of my favorite spots in Virginia. The professor's already told me a great deal about you. Ah. I was sure Thomas and Richard would become best of friends, but as they talked, I could begin to sense that this was not to be. Right on time, Richard. 
I knew you would not disappoint us. Well, yes, as we agreed, Betelgeuse has ascended over the Wren building, so here I am. Betelgeuse? You must mean Bellatrix. Pardon me? You have them reversed. As Orion rises, it is first Bellatrix, then Betelgeuse, that sets sail into the night sky. Betelgeuse hasn't even cleared the roof yet, as you can see. Oh, well, I guess I misjudged the angle. I suppose astronomy is not my strongest suit. What is your strongest suit? Excuse me? Boys, please, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that we are here and ready. Or we shall be momentarily. Pardon me. <clears throat> A drink to the memory of martyred saints, to mangled limbs and bloody taints. Is that whiskey? Is there enough to share? Definitely not for you two, young lads. Now, Thomas, take a look. Do you spy anything in the melancholy scene before us that might befuddle our plans? Um, the crescent flames lighting up the courtyard? Correct. We need darkness to do the deed. Shall I fetch a pail of water? That won't be necessary, Thomas. Richard has something even more devious in store. Indeed. Voila. What's in the bag? Baking soda. I had one of my slaves fetch it from our kitchen back at the plantation. Oh, I've never tried this technique myself. Richard promises it will provide an effective means to snuff out the flames. Oh, it'll work, Professor. Once I hurl this bag upon the crescent... Baking soda will heat up, releasing carbon dioxide. Yes, displacing the oxygen necessary for the fire... And thus and extinguishing it without the need to pour water upon the fatwood. Not to mention there will be no great hiss of steam to attract attention. Oh, good point. All that will remain is a bit of sodium carbonate and a small, and a small quantity, quantity of, of oxygen. oxygen. Impressive. What on earth are you boys talking about? You not familiar with carbon dioxide, Professor? It's a component of the air we breathe. A very small component. It was only recently discovered by a Scottish physician. Not another blasted Scot. Yes, Joseph Black, Black I, I believe. believe. Oh, for God's sakes. Richard, you too read the London Journal of Physical Chemistry? Yes, my father has a subscription. Bloody hell, boys, you're taking all the fun out of this. Really? When did the fun start, Professor? I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Richard, I want you to give a signal if anyone approaches the courtyard while Thomas and I are in action. Some kind of call or whistle. I know, an owl. I do a marvelous impression of a barred owl. Let's hear it. <coughs> Fine, that'll work. I don't know, Richard. That seems a bit elaborate. Elaborate? We need something quicker and more to the point. <sighs> like a screech owl. <whistles> Whatever. Impatient to plot our next move, I turn to the Wren building. But to my dismay, a man had appeared, standing in the middle of the courtyard, his heavily draped back turned towards us. The aforementioned crescent fire cast an enormous flickering shadow of the man on the brick of the building. He seemed to have come from nowhere, but then I had been distracted by the boys bickering. Eventually, they too noticed the man. Who's that, Professor? I don't know, Thomas. I can't see his face. Shall we retreat? I didn't answer. Something about the man compelled my attention. Wait right here, I said. Boys, wait right here. I stepped out from behind my office and slowly made my way into the courtyard. I'm sure he could hear my footsteps on the ice, but he made no movements. Finally, when I was within reaching distance, I called out, My good man! And that's when he turned. God in heaven, that face! It was horrible. Half it ripped apart as if by the claws of a rabid beast. The light of the crescent flame danced on its ragged ridges. The part that wasn't on was twisted into a grotesque expression of pain. He stared at me from deep-set eyes, two black pits carved from some accursed quarry. Jobriath. Jobriath, he muttered. I couldn't believe it. Help me. I was trembling, both with fear and from the stabbing cold which penetrated to my very core. Are you all right, man? We must find you a doctor. No. It is you I seek. Who are you? Do I know you? Caleb Jobriath. You must help me. Help you how? Exabeth. I knew instantly who he was referring to. There was only one person in this colony with the misfortune to be christened with that appalling appellation. Hexabeth Blackard? Yes. As far as I knew at the time, Hexabeth Blackard was merely the attractive widow who owned the King's Crown Tavern. Save her. Save her? From what? Save her. Time is running out. I don't understand. You have to. Before it's too late. Just then I heard two owls screeching in the night. I turned to look at the boys who were crouching in the shadows, and then I turned back to look at the man, but he was gone. With so many footprints in the slush, I was unable to ascertain the direction in which he had fled, so I made my way back to Richard and Thomas. They told me they'd had enough standing in the cold, and wished to return to their dormitory to compare notes on Chaucer. I didn't want to frighten them with what I'd just experienced, so I didn't say anything about my encounter. It was deeply troubling, though. I'll never forget that night as long as I... remained dead. My first inkling about the truth of Hexabeth Blackard... And although at first I did want to help her, I soon learned it was too late. Repent, Hexabeth. Repent no, while you still can. No. 
I couldn't save her. But you've probably already heard that story, haven't you, Julie? Julie? Where did she go? Would it be all right if we left the professor for a moment? I'm curious about what's happening over at the Halloween show at the Equator, Williamsburg's number one hangout for the William & Mary artsy crowd. When we last left the upstairs storage room of the club, campus psychic Megan Marshall was in the throes of an eerie seance. She and her friends were trying to glean information regarding the whereabouts of Aaron Seeger, the vanished lead singer of the college rock band Cats with Benefits. However, it appears they have unwittingly crossed paths with someone else, someone who was not interested in helping them find their friend. Tell me, who are you people? We're students at the College of William & Mary. Do you know it? Yes, yes. I know it well. But you're a woman. How can you be a student? Women have been students for a long time. When did you die exactly? I don't remember. Who is your king now? King? We haven't had a king for 200 years. 200 years? Why, yes. This is the year of our Lord. Seriously? 2000. The year of our Lord? What? Since when do you talk like that? She's a 200-year-old ghost. Isn't that how they talk? I can't believe it's been so long. What kind of world do you live in? Are you free? Are you enslaved? No, we're free. Yeah. Everyone's free now. For the most part. Things have changed a lot since Jefferson's time. Jefferson? I knew a Jefferson. His name was Thomas. Holy shit! You knew Thomas Jefferson? How dare you speak to me like Sorry. that? Like he said, it's a very different time now. <laughs> Good manners aren't as important. Hey, is Jefferson there? Can we talk to him? I don't know where Thomas is. How do you know him? He was our president. President? I, I don't understand. He was the leader of our country. You know, America. Young Master Jefferson? That's ridiculous. He was but a boy when I last saw him. And not very wise. Hmm. He did terrible things. Terrible things? What do you mean? Like Sally Hemings? Never mind. If you cannot help me, I want to go. Wait, this is just starting to get good. I want to hear more about Jefferson. He's not worth my time. Please let me go. It's fine. Go if you need to. But, uh, I'm sorry we couldn't help you. So am I. Take me to the door, and I'll be on my way. Wait a minute. She's getting up. Stop her. Why? Come on, Megan. What's going on? Come back to us. <laughs> we'll buy you a beer. I said I want to leave. But you can't just leave. That's not your body. <sighs> Give me a break. Megan. Who's Megan? Are you still in there? I'm not, I'm not Megan. Megan. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Okay. okay. But you can't just walk out like this. I don't, I don't understand. understand. I want, I want to leave now. now! Oh, good lord, Megan. This isn't fun anymore. I'll find my own way out. Wait. There must be a door. Megan. Let go of my arm. Dude. Hey. Megan, can you hear Let me? Let go! Fuck. Ah, she hit Whoa. me. Jesus. Megan, take it down a notch. I'm not, not Megan. Megan. Don't, don't tell me what to do. Oh, my God. Curse this darkness and curse you all. Oh, no, we're cursed. All right, Shut guys. the door. Don't let her go. What? She can leave if she wants. Bree, I don't think she's faking it. What a good fool. You're kidding. You really think she's possessed? I don't know. Oh, come on, man. There has to be a way out. Whatever. This is getting too strange for me. Nothing but walls. I'm out of walls, here. Walls everywhere. You leaving the party? See you later. Wait for me! I heard a door. Where is it? Megan. Bree, what's going on in there? Oh, hey, Jordan. Where's, Where's the, door? the door? Be careful. It's getting pretty weird in there. What? What's happening? What is that noise? That chick Megan is putting on quite a show. It's pretty impressive, actually. Is that the hell? Yeah. She's got, like, hidden speakers uh, and... I knew it. It's so loud. Hey, listen, guys. Ugh. You should not be... Caleb? Oh, hi, Josh. <sighs> what are you doing uh, here? I was just a little curious about the seance, I guess. Am I in hell? No, I'm worried about Megan. <sighs> Dude, come on. It's all an act. What's she doing? A window? She's going for an Oscar. It's a window. Duh. Is she alright? This will be my way out. Whoa! Damn! Shit! <sighs> Fresh air. Oh my god, that girl's crazy. The bitter night calls to me. What the hell? Winds take my spirit. What is she on? Set me free! Grab her! She's jumping! She's trying to go out the window! Caleb! <laughs> I've got her. Let me go, you cootie. Whoa. Caleb, don't let go. What the hell's wrong with her? Easy, Megan. <sighs> Stop moving. Let go. I want to die. Just calm down. Hold on. Damn it. Here, let I me. have to die to live. Megan. Ted. Someone uh, I can't. Uh, I'm trying. I can't. Watch out. Don't let her fall. <sighs> She's fucking strong. Careful. Hold on, Megan. I'm not Megan. God damn it. I'm Hexabeth. It's too heavy. Uh, I'm gonna drop there's her. too much glass. Let me go. I can't get a grip. Uh, Help. Here, take the towel. What? Bust out the glass. No, no. Okay, I've got a hold of her. All right, all right. Let's pour in. One, 
two. Gideon! Gideon. Gideon. Who's Gideon? Pull. Uh, uh, Caleb! Uh, are you all right? Uh, no, my arm. What's wrong? I uh, cut my arm. Caleb! He's bleeding uh, everywhere. Shit! Oh my god. Uh, I'll have to get another cow to wrap his arm. Jesus! Josh, call an ambulance. I am. I am. Uh, Ted! What can I do? I, I don't know. Yes. I need an ambulance. This looks really bad. Equator uh, on 305 uh, South uh, Henry Street. What about Megan? Is she all right? I don't know. Go look! My friends cut themselves on some glass. She's got cuts too. Okay. They both need help. Let me see. Okay. Uh, I'll go get the manager. What a fucking nightmare. Let me die. Josh. It's okay, Kim. The ambulance is on its way. You'll be fine. I promise. Yeah. God, I can stop. Well, that was stressful. I hope no one was permanently injured. We can't stick around to find out, though. We're on a very tight schedule, and our next stop is the Williamsburg Police Department. The police are stressed out, too. What with the discovery of two bodies on the old country... Oh, wait. I don't think I was supposed to say anything about that yet. Forget what I just said. Tanner to Perry. Tanner to Perry. You copy? Copy, yeah. I got an intox over the green leaf that could use a ride. Can you handle? Sure. What's the description? White male, age 20, in a gorilla costume. God, I hate it. Hey, Tanner. Tracy. Tell Perry. Be careful with that gorilla. Tell him yourself. Here. Hey, Perry. Be careful with that gorilla. Things might get hairy. Dang it. We've missed your shitty jokes around the station. <laughs> it's not just my jokes you're missing, baby. Well, maybe we should do something about that. Come on now. People can hear you. <laughs> Can we just get that gorilla taken care of? 10-4. En route now. 10-4. Hey, Tracy, you headed home? Hey, you better believe it. I am dead tired. What a night, huh? <sighs> I could barely keep up with everything that was going on. I don't doubt that. My radio started going crazy the second my shift started. Yeah, Uncle's neck really threw us for a loop. <sighs> Man. And that was on top of the normal craziness we have to deal with. I hear you. And those poor kids over at the equator. What a mess. Mm. I heard there was a fair amount of blood to clean up. Oh, my. I hope those snowflakes weren't traumatized. I think that club was supposed to be their safe space. I'm sure they'll be fine. Not like anyone died. You know, the chief's been looking for a reason to shut that place down. That's a shame. It's been around forever. I know, and it was just now starting to get respectable. Yeah? You know, that's where Carsey Headrest got his start. What? My niece used to play with him sometimes Carsey, at... who now? Oh, never mind. Hey, Tracy, before you leave, c- come here. Did Byron fill you in on any details? Details? About those bodies at Uncle Snap? Ugh. A couple of the guys are saying... What? They're saying that the old country road killer is back in business. Jesus, can't anyone around here keep their mouth shut? Can you confirm? Sorry, honey, Byron's just not giving me much. No? Well, I wouldn't be surprised. Nothing surprises me in this town anymore. Hey, Tracy, what do you got in the back? Tracy Daggett. Long time, no see. Ed. Ed Jackson. What a surprise. Same here. I thought you were pushing parking tickets with the campus police now. I am. I just picked the wrong night to make some extra cash. Sorry, I gotta interrupt here. Do you all remember Ed? He's the guy that shot Aaron and Professor Welsh in the basement of the Smoot House and got this whole mess started. I was hoping we'd never have to see him again, but it's hard to avoid people in a town this small. So tell me, Ed, what's a sketchy devil dealer like you doing in my police station? Oh, come on, Tracy. Seems kind of risky. Hey, is that any way to talk to an old Lafayette High School classmate? You? Yeah. Well, sounds like you two have some catching up to do. I'll leave you to it. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Night. So, Tracy, you got a second? Make it fast, Ed. I've got to get to bed. Can you repeat? So I overheard some talk about a couple of bodies uh, out of the old country road. Oh, for Christ's sakes, what am I, a goddamn walking Ouija board? I have no idea what's going on. Sorry, you are Byron's sister. I just thought you might have heard. Piss off, Ed. I ain't got time for this. Wait, Tracy, what do you got in the bag? Nothing. It's just something I picked up on patrol. Really? Looks kind of weird. Very weird. That's for damn sure. <clears throat> but actually, Ed, have you ever seen anything like this before? Can't say that I have. Uh, where exactly did you find it? Out at the old... You found that on the bodies? No! It's got nothing to do with that. Not that there were any bodies. I found it over at... Where? The old Dunhill place. I thought I'd show it to the guys in the lab. Can and... I, uh, take a closer look? Yeah, sure. Careful, though. There's, there's razor blades in it. 
Ugh, it's sticky. I know. Wait a minute, are those feathers and a bird foot? It's some messed up shit, all right. And is that a picture of Marlon Brando? Beats me. Ugh. So you said it's not related to Uncle's neck? Nope. It's not connected to any case? No. Have you shown it to anyone? No. Well, how much do you want for it? What? I'll give you 200 in cash. Well, it's not mine to sell. Says who? I'll, I'll give you 300. Why? I know a guy who collects shit like this. He'd want this piece of crap. All right, Tracy. 500. Five. But that's my last offer. By the way, I hear your mother's not doing so well with the bookies. What? Some extra cash might come in handy right now. Mind about. your own damn business. Might even be able to put in a good word with some people. Look, Ed. I can make a call right now. Ugh. Come on. I'm losing interest. Jesus, Ed, you are really twisting my tits here. Just trying to help. Lafayette forever, right? <sighs> Last chance, Tracy. Take it or leave it. God damn it, all right. Meet me out back in ten minutes. Will do. What a fucking night. Mr. Tolliver, I I'm at the police station now. Yeah, they found the bodies just like you wanted. But I found something else you might be interested in. Can we meet tomorrow? What? Come on, Mr. Tolliver. I, I can barely keep... Fine. See you then. Asshole. Oh, dear. Mr. Tolliver. His name's come up a couple of times in our story, but so far we don't really know who he is. He does seem to be behind a lot of bad stuff, though. I'm curious why he'd be interested in the strange item Tracy picked up at the old Dunhill place. However, I'm not curious enough to hang around to watch the impending parking lot transaction. Frankly, I'm a little disappointed in Tracy. How about we head back to the Williamsburg Cemetery and find out what happened to Julie? A blessed evening to you, Professor Jabriath. Governor Fouquier. Please, Professor. I've told you to stop calling me that. No one's paid me any heed for centuries. Sorry, Francis. Old habits are hard to break. Uh, did you happen to see a young girl about 18 wandering around the cemetery? I was just telling her a story about Thomas Jefferson Oh, and... Julie. Yes, in fact. I was listening to you two from the edge of the woods. Well, what happened to her? She left, you old windbag. Halfway through your story. What? I can't believe that after decades and decades of practice, you still haven't learned how to properly structure a narrative. I beg your pardon? So much tedious build-up before you get to the good stuff. Thomas and Richard, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, but I completely disagree. Character development is crucial for setting oh, the scene. Oh, please. You should just skip straight to the murder and torture and demons. That's what I'd want to hear about. Yes, because you have decadent tastes. Well, how about more of the real skinny on young Mr. Jefferson? I've heard so many rumors about the awful things he did whilst under Hexabeth's spell, but you never seem to recount those stories. Because they are patently untrue, and even if something like that did happen, I wouldn't tell you. I'm a man of discretion. Oh, pish posh. You're merely boring. Just like all the other hoary old ghosts who drift around this town. How offended, Francis. Most spirits don't have the mental faculty to carry on a meaningful conversation like we're having. You're right about that. Most spectres are hardly more than a collection of ticks, twitches and catchphrases, barely rising above the level of squirrels. Hmm. But you and I are different, aren't we? Why is that? I don't know, Francis. I wonder if it has something to do with the depth of our feelings. I have a theory that powerful emotions like love, rage or grief keep us strong and sharp even in death. Hmm. For example, why do you stay in Williamsburg if you're so unhappy here? Well, you know, I still have hopes of reuniting with Catherine. My point exactly. I see. Even though I haven't seen my wife since she died, I still keep expecting to stumble across her one day, snipping daisies in some mossy old garden. Oh. It's the only thing that gives me hope in this endless afterlife. You poor soul. Oh, and also, I'm hoping to someday learn the answer to a question that's been gnawing away at my brain for ages. And what is that? What drives you, Professor Dubrive? You have been listening to another installment of the handcrafted audio drama Lost in Williamsburg. Tonight's episode was entitled Up All Night. 
This evening's cast included Frederick Corney as Professor Jabriath, Mark Hudgens as Thomas Jefferson, Cal Shuey as Richard Holcomb, Pete Lutz as Gideon Blackard, Reed Perkins as Caleb Souter, Calvin Glasby as Ted, Brian Long as Bree, Clara Penix as Megan Marshall, Colleen Kennedy as Hexabeth Blackard, Jacob Wilson as Josh Ryder, Claudia Swain as Jordan Bales, Krista Mauser as Tracy Daggett, Debbie Burcham as Tanner, Michael Turner as Ed Jackson, Dennis Lintock as Perry, and Timothy Costello as Francis Fauquier. Tune in next time as the story continues. This episode of Lost in Williamsburg was measured, sawed, sanded, and nailed by Philip Merritt with the assistance of a few Creative Commons sound effects from freesound.org. Thank you for listening. This is your host, Caroline Corney, saying, I know we said last time that this was going to be the last episode of the season, but we've decided to split the finale into two shows. And before you send those angry letters complaining that this decision is a purely cynical cash grab, let me just say, you're right. But if it's any consolation, we'll be spending those extra profits to fly down to a resort in Barbados, where we'll be plotting out season three. Good night.